All right, good morning, everybody. So uh, this talk is uh, introducing HDD. It's a play on words uh, with TDD, test-driven development, and similar kinds of things. As we will see, they are, uh, we have been continuously improving the Elixir programming language. And two of the major features that are coming uh, in the next Elixir releases, they were inspired and improved on and it's a continuation of work done by John Hughes, which is actually here at the event. He gave a keynote presentation last year as well. Okay, so it's a play of words in the sense that, you know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, for the interest driven development, we write the test first. And here the joke is that uh, if you want to have a new feature in your programming language, you wait, you wait for John Hughes to write a paper about it, and then you add it to the programming language, and everyone can enjoy uh, better programming languages at the end of the day. <clears throat> All right, so uh, before I get into the talk per se, I wanted to talk a little bit about Elixir, where we are right now, and, and what we expect in the future, give a little bit of context. So we just released January, um, this year, we released Elixir 1.6 and uh, we're really proud because we crossed the 700 contributors mark. Uh, we are, the ecosystem continues to grow. We are almost reaching 6,000 packages and over 175 million downloads. And, uh, we, and we have a, a lot of exciting features, but the big feature that came in Elixir 1.6, uh, also a very controversial one, uh, is the code for matter. Right, so what is the idea of a code formatter? Is that it formats code, okay? So here's some code. It doesn't matter what this code does, but what matters here is that this code is inconsistent. Sometimes, you know, people add uh, spaces after comma. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they add extra new lines. Sometimes they do not. So the idea of a code formatter is that we are going to get an input file and we are going to discard almost all of the style that is in there and we are going to output it with a consistent style, with a consistent format, ignoring almost everything that you wrote in terms of style, okay? In terms of, in terms of format. So that's there, it's released. You can use it today in your Elixir project. And uh, our experience with it has been really great so far. We're going to talk more about it soon. And our goal also is in Elixir 1.7, so it releases every six months. So the next release is going to be Alex 0.7. It's likely going to be in July this year. And we don't know how many contributors we have. We don't know what is going to be the state of the ecosystem. But we know that uh, one of the features that we want to have in Alex 0.7 is the addition of something that we call stream data. And stream data has two responsibilities, okay? So the first one that it has is that is of data generation. So Elixir, we have something called streams, which are lazy collections, right? So you can generate anything lazily. The idea of stream data is that we're going to get the same concept of lazy generation, okay, and apply it to the data types that we have in the language. So for example, here in this code, which I hope you're seeing it, yes. So here in this code, um, we import the stream data module. Now we have something like an integer generator that can uh, generate random streams lazily and infinitely, okay? So we say, hey, give me 10, and then I can get the same integer generator and ask for more 10, and then it goes and goes, 10 more, okay? And the, one of the reasons why we have data generation, want to have stream data generation uh, in Elixir, it's because it will allow us to add property-based testing, okay? So here, for example, we are going to explore what is property-based testing uh, throughout the talk. Okay, but the idea here is that instead of coming up with examples for testing our functions or testing our software, we, def we write properties and let those properties generate the different examples. So we are thinking now, we're not thinking about how this code should behave under this particular code example, but we are thinking about the general property that that code should emit. Okay? And, uh, and the reason why I said introducing HDD is exactly because uh, those two ideas uh, the code formatter and property-based testing, it's built on papers and on ideas introduced by John Hughes, which is sitting right here. Thank you for coming, John. And, uh, and John is Welsh, right? Yes, I got it. And uh, he's a professor at Chalmers University. 
And what we are going to do for the talk today is that we are going to exactly see how those two features, the code for matter and the stream data, they are implemented. And we are going to talk a little bit you know, about the papers that introduced them and how those ideas, they changed uh, and were developed throughout time, okay? So let's start with the code for matter. So what is a code for matter? We know that a code for matter formats your code using a consistent style. And the goal with the code for matter is to help you focus on what matters. Who here has participated in a style discussion in a code base? Please, right? Almost everyone have had such discussion, right? Which way is better, okay? And we have been able to automatize those things to a certain extent. So we have things like linters that will check if your pull request, you know, if you are being consistent, if you are being consistent, if you are adding a space after the comma, if you are not adding extra new lines. So we have tools to check for that. But why is the computer telling us, right, what to do? And why doesn't it go and solve the problem for us, right? Well, if I'm not supposed to use two space, if I'm supposed to use one space after a comma, why it doesn't do that for me? So that's the goal of the code for matter. And the thing that it enables, imagine for example, you are in a project, you send a pull, you send a pull request, and then uh, there is a linter that review your code. And in a, in a place it says, well, the line length here is 82 characters, but you've configured it to be 80, right? And then you have another comment that says, well, the cyclomatic complexity of this function is high, you should refactor it. Which one would you like to go to tackle first, right? They want about the complexity. That's what we want to focus on. So the code for matter eliminates a bunch of those issues, okay? We can just focus on the, the code quality aspect and not about the style per se. And it's a very good tool for newcomers because when you are joining a new team, when you are uh, learning a new programming language, one of the things that you want to do is, well, I want to write this code as everybody in the company does, or I want to write this code like everybody in the community does. So you usually have a friend, you have a coworker, or you get somebody else's repository, and you try to replicate that style, right? But that's a slow feedback cycle. With the formatter, when you are learning, you just run a command in your editor, for example, and you get that feedback immediately. Oh, that's how the code should look like. Fantastic. And we wanted to unify uh, the code written by teams in the community, right? That's the other goal. So just as an example, right? The Elixir community, as pretty much any other community, we have style guides, which is a very long document that says how you should style your code, okay? And for a long time, people asked for us to add, for example, a style guide to the Elixir project. But I never liked the idea because I don't like the idea of Imagine that someone wants to contribute to the language for the first time. I don't like the idea of saying, hey, read this document with a thousand lines before you send your contribution, okay? With a, a thousand lines of text before you even think about sending your contribution, right? That's not very welcoming, okay? So now that we have the code for matter, one of the things that I did is that I picked up one of those style guides and I set a pull request showing all of the rules that we don't have to worry about now that we have a code for matter and we reduce the, the style guide size to half, right? So now you don't need to worry about any of those rules when you are writing the code, when you are reviewing the code, and so on. The code for matter in Elixir is built on top of three principles, okay? So the first one is that it does not change the code statics, okay? And that's because, well, if the formatter can break your code or change your code, you're not going to trust it, and then you're not going to run it, so it's room, right? It doesn't fit its purpose. We also want to minimize configuration because if we provide a tool that has a bunch of configuration, instead of people now back shedding over the style, they're going to back shed over the configuration. Oh, this configuration is better than this one. Look how this code is better, right? And then we're not going to be productive. And no special cases. Elixir was designed to be an extensible language. So we don't want to have a tool that knows constructs that are part of the language, right? So we don't want to add those special rules. It need to be general rules for everybody. It's the same concept that we apply for the compiler. Uh, even though when we are building the Elixir in the library, we have direct access to the compiler, we don't like adding special cases in the compiler because it means that the tools that we have to create the language, they are no longer available for everybody. And we don't like that, right? We want the tools that we use to create the language to be available to everybody. And that's why we are able to write a lot of Elixir in Elixir itself. So how do you use the formatter, okay? I imagine you are sold. So how do you use that? In Elixir, you just run mix format. 
but usually you have integration with your editor that's going to run make format for you okay so what is so what is the idea which problem we are trying to solve here so let's talk a little bit about the implementation so imagine we have this code or even this data structure memory okay um, so it's a list here where we have the a key and the value for the a key is another list with three elements and then we have the b key uh, with the atom okay as value there right now imagine that we want to render this code or render this data structure and we have a line length maximum here of 25 characters so a maximum of 25 columns because this code fits there we can just render it in line right we just render it straight however what happens if we have only 20 columns right it doesn't fit anymore okay so now we need to break it we need to render it like this so we need to break it apart now break over multiple lines well and what happens if now we have only 10 columns right we need to break it again right and we are going to render it like this at the end of the day sure if you break if you make it small then at some point it's not going to fit and they are going to go over the 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 line length that it has specified but as soon as we have reasonable space we can break the, the document over multiple lines and have it fit in that limit okay so to, so to allow us to do that um, we, we use something that we call document algebra which is an idea that was introduced by this paper from John Hughes which is called the design of a printing printing library and what I really like about this paper is that at the beginning it, it does not only present the idea is that the question that it makes at the beginning is well we have a problem which is pretty printing how can we tackle uh, writing a pretty printing library uh, using a functional language using a functional uh, concept what are the basic functions the basic types that we need to have to express that and that's how so it's a very elegant way of approaching the problem and solving that problem and coming up with the properties that we expect when we derive the functions and types that we have in our code right so the idea here is that so for example if we have a data type or if we have some code and we want to format it we are going to break into a bunch of documents and i'm going to show the documents that we have and here there it's already a translation uh, from the paper to how we implemented those things in elixir okay so we have a couple documents so the first document is the text document itself which is a string that is going to be rendered as the string itself okay so text and then we want to have a nesting document which says well I have this document and if this document uh, by any chance there is a line break in it we want to uh, nest everything after the line break okay by the number of spaces by the number of columns and then we have the line document that introduces a new line between two other documents okay we have the concat document that concatenates two documents and then we have the empty document okay so how we are going to render our data structures using those constructs so for example imagine that we have a list one two three and we want to render everything in the same line what do we do so we first start with the opening bracket document and then we are going to concatenate uh, the first element of the list which in this case is one with the comma and then the second the third fourth fifth if we had it okay and then we do the last one we skip the comma and then we put the final concatenation with the closing bracket okay well so that's one way to render this document but we know that we also want to sometimes have the same list and we don't have enough space we want to render it like this we want to have uh, a line between each of those elements in the list right so how are we going to write that so very similar construct we start with the opening bracket and then we introduce a line between the bracket and the first element the second and so on and then after we add the last element remember that we want to nest everything we have so far all those lines breaks the elements we have so far we want to nest it by two elements so we have a nest call here right before the last line okay and then we have the last line and we introduce the closing bracket okay so all right now we know how to print this uh, this code this data structure in two different ways but then it comes the question right how are we going to choose between layouts? Because we don't want to choose up front if it's this way or the other way, right? We want to be able to do that as we're rendering the document and we know how much space we have left, okay? And if we look at these, those documents, they are similar, but there are some differences, right? So for example, in this one, when everything's in the single line, we don't have a nesting, okay? But well, 
if we have uh, a line breaks, then we need to consider the nesting. So we need to come up with the properties that are going to allow us to render those documents uh, similarly and express those documents in a similar way. And the idea here, so one of the properties that we can think is that, well, for the document that, there, there are, that has no line breaks, we could actually call nest, okay, because, you know, if you have no line breaks, nest is not going to do anything. It doesn't matter, it doesn't make any difference. And when we do that, those documents, they become closer to each other, right? The difference here is that one calls concat and the other calls line, okay? And, uh, and when we, we chose to implement this, uh, to answer this question of how we're going to choose which document to render, the state of the art at the time was outlined in a paper uh, by Philip Wadler uh, called A Prettier P Printer. And I don't know if it was Philip, the first one who started to... So we have a bunch of papers about printing printing and with, eventually they start to have only very smart jobs, like pr uh, very smart titles like a prettier printer, a secret printer. So it's also a very interesting part of accompanying the whole development of pretty printers. Um, but the idea here with a prettier printer was it provided a way to solve this problem that was more performant and required less code than the previous solutions at the time. And so the idea of how we get flexible layout and how we implemented it in Elixir initially is that if you have a list and that list can be rendered in a single line or broken apart, we would say that it is a group. Right? So we say, hey, we have this group of things that they are the, either breaking apart and are rendered of multiple lines or they are rendered all together. And how we would implement group would be with a function similar to this, and that's how we implemented initially. We would have choose that would be able to choose which format, okay? And we say, well, I'm going to receive a document and I have to choose between two documents. One of those documents is when I get all of the lines, right, all the line documents in that construct and replace it by a concatenation, which means I have a document that may break over multiple lines, right? But I take off the lines and use a direct concatenation. So that's one document that I'm trying to, to use. And the other one is the document itself with all of the lines, okay? So basically, we need to choose between those two documents. If the first one fits in a line completely, okay? Then we are going to choose that. But if it doesn't, then we are going to use the other, right? So what we do is that we are going to pass to the group function, we're going to pass the second document, the one on the right side, right? And it's going to convert to the first, the first document by replacing all lines but to concatenation. And then it's going to choose that based if it fits on the, uh, on the current space that we have left or not, okay? And that's how we implemented it. So uh, someone set up a request. It has been almost uh, five years ago, okay? Because when we started doing this in Elixir, it was not for formatting code. It was for uh, pretty printing data structures. Okay, so someone sent a pull request with, which had all of the work and then he says, well, we are implementing the Hughes Wadler document algebra and so on. Okay, and then uh, as we started using this code, someone said, well, actually, the implementation we have here, it's very, very slow. So I think they had a, a document, a 80 megabytes document with a bunch of data types. And when we were printing, printing, it was taking like 30 seconds or something like that. And why is that, right? Because the papers, they were written with Haskell in mind, and Haskell uh, has lazy evaluation, and Elixir has strict eager evaluation. So what would happen here is that every time we define a group, we would, at that moment, go and get the document and replace all, of the, all of the lines by concatenation at that moment. We wouldn't do that lazily, okay? So we had to solve this problem. Let's try to understand this problem a little bit uh, better, right? So, Imagine that we have this data structure here, right? So we have uh, this list with another list inside. And then we know when, and we have 25 columns here. We know that when we go to 10 columns, it breaks it like that. How many groups do we have here, right? We have two groups, right? We have the outer one that when it doesn't fit, it breaks once. And then we have the, and then we have the inner group, right? So you can see that as you have complex data structures that are nested, the number of groups they are going to grow. And what would happen when we had this code, when we run this code in Elixir, is that we would, every time we call, add two more considerations. We would duplicate the documents, and then duplicate again, and then duplicate again. It would grow exponentially, and it would be super slow. Okay? Luckily, somebody has solved this problem as well, which is a paper by Christian Lindig, which I assume is not here. <laughs> uh, and it's called Strictly Pretty. And basically, it gets the ideas that we had in, uh, in Waller's paper 
and Hugh's paper before it and convert that to a strict language. That's why, again, the clever title is strictly pretty, right? Uh, which was OCaml. So uh, Gustavo Brunoro, he got that, uh, he got the initial pull request, converted that to use Lindex algorithm, okay? And we got very good performance out of it, okay? So how does document algebra works in Elixir? Uh, it is implemented by a module called inspect.algebra uh, and we use it initially to inspect data structures, right? So every time you are in the terminal in Elixir and you get a data structure back, that data structure is just ones and zeros, right, in memory. But when you get it back, we get a format and we are generating this format with the help of inspect algebra. So we use it to inspect data structures, but we are now also using it by the code formatter, okay? Because the problem is the same, right? Except that with the code formatter, instead of having data structures, we have codes like function calls, right? And we need to do the same thing. If it doesn't fit in, on the same line, we need to break it apart once, we need to break it apart twice, and so on, okay? The difference, however, is that to implement the code formatter uh, using spec algebra, the algebra that we had there, it's not enough because the uh, code requires more complex rules. So throughout time, we did extensions to the document algebra library that we have in Elixir. So one of those is to have, this we use for colored uh, printing printing in the terminal. So it's the idea of adding colors. Okay, that's one of those. Uh, we also added the support to nest based on the cursor because the previous nesting would always nest by two spaces, for example. You have to say how much you had to nest. So this is just a convenience where you can say, well, nest, to whatever the cursor is, the pretty printing, when it's rendering, it knows how many columns it needs to start. So nest by whatever the cursor is right now, okay? We also add another document called force unfit and a couple others, right? So just as, a, as an example uh, of usage of one of those new uh, documents. So how does force unfit work? So here's some Elixir code. Imagine we are calling a function called code and it's, we are passing three arguments to it. The first one is the atom, okay? And the second argument is a here doc string. It's a string, but syntactically we, we break it because it's going to have multiple lines. We use the here doc notation, okay? And then we have the last argument, some arg, right? This doesn't look nice, right? Because we have, because the truth is that this thing is not being rendered in a single line. We have something there in the middle that breaks over multiple lines. So we force unfit what allows us to do is to say, look, every time we have a here doc, we, we say that it is unfit. Every time we have a here doc inside a function call or inside another data structure, we just want to consider that the whole thing needs to break apart, even if it never goes over the line length. The line length doesn't matter anymore. We just want to break it. Okay, we want the surrounding uh, group there to break. And so on. All right, so that's how we got code formatter working with Elixir. In Elixir, we're just building on top uh, of papers, implementations, and ideas. Uh, that appeared for all time. And the second feature that is coming, the future Elixir version, is the stream data, right? And as I said at the beginning of the talk, one of the goals of stream data is actually to help us to write property-based tests. And before we talk about property-based tests, let's talk about the issues that we have, we have in example-based testing, right? So example-based testing, it's likely the kind of test that we write every day, right? Most of us write every day. So, uh, what is the, so how does those tests look like in Elixir? It's something like this, we call a cert and we call the function that we want to test. So imagine here that we are testing string.contains. We want to test if the string that is given uh, a second argument is, con if this, sorry, if the string that is given as first argument contains the string given a second argument, okay? So that's, so when we are testing this functionality, what do we do? We come up with a bunch of examples, we need to think about a bunch of different examples, okay? So we say, wow, I have a string full bar, so I want to test with the beginning of the string full bar, which is true. So we test that, we test with bar, we test with something that is in the middle of the string, right? We test with something that does not exist, so we come up with a bunch of tests, okay? So the question that comes from this is, how are we going to find corner cases? Because since we are the ones coming up with the examples, how can we be sure that we came up with all the relevant examples that we don't forget something crucial, okay? Or more importantly, how we are, even when we think about the corner cases, right? How we are about them? How we are going to know? Well, for this particular scenario, should it be true or false, right? We need to have a good meta model to answer those questions. So, for example, a string contains, 
right, with a string full bar and an empty string. Should this be true or false, right? What about this other one? The second one is a bit easier, right? Uh, a string cannot contain something that is bigger than the string itself, right? But we need to remember to think about those cases, right? And about the empty string, does the empty string contain the empty string? Right? We need to remember to think about those. And we actually struggle with this in Elixir. So, um, so when we were struggling to think, well, how should the string contains behave? Uh, Thomas Arts, he would come and he said, look, um, for a string contains, this is the simplest property that I can think for this function. So in this case, we are not even using the property based tests, the property based tests in Elixir, but thinking about the properties was helping us solve this problem. So we say, look, the simplest property that I can write for this code is this one. And according to this property, this particular thing should return true and this should return false and so on. Right? So it was giving us this metal model. And as we used it, uh, so sometimes we'd have questions, we'd ping Thomas, like, Thomas, which property would you write? And then he would tell us the property. So eventually it became clear that we would have a better sound library if we were writing property-based tests to accompany it. That's why we decided to introduce at least stateless property-based testings tests to Elixir. So how it would look like in Elixir? It would look like this. So I say, hey, I want to check all, okay, uh, and then we, we are going to ask the string generator to generate a bunch of strings that are going to have on the left side. We are going to ask another string generator to generate a bunch of strings that go on the right side, okay, and then we concatenate the two of them. And then we want to assert that the string contains the string on the left and contains the string on the right. That's a very simple property that we expect this code to obey. Okay? And eventually, when generating random data, it's going to generate empty strings, which are going to test the scenarios I was just talking about. Okay? So property-based testing is often described also as generative testing because we are now uh, generating data instead of coming up in, with examples from our mind. Okay? Uh, it's useful to describe the invariants in the system, things that should always be true. right? And it leads to fully tested software that is designed with intent, right? Sometimes you're using a library or you're using a function. It says, well, if this function uh, is passed an empty string, it behaves like this. If it passes an string that is not empty, it's going to behave like that, right? And, oh, if it receives an empty list, so even for things of the same type, it behaves differently. And when you see a code that is like that, that is documented like that, it's because nobody thought about the underlying property that that code should exhibit. And we see that leaking in the documentation, which is going to leak, which is going to leak when you're using that API as well. Right? You need to have all those cases. You need to handle all those cases because there's no underlying property. And the paper that introduced this is the quick check paper uh, by John Hughes and Con Klassen. And... Um, and quick check is a lightweight tool for random testing of Haskell programs. Okay? And we decided to implement that in Elixir as well. Except that now we've learned our lesson, right? It's right there in the title. It's for Haskell programs. Generating data lazily in Haskell is going to be different from generating data lazily in Elixir. So instead of finding out that we're implementing the wrong thing along the way, so we said, well, you know, we know that this implementation, the, the Elixir implementation is going to have to be different. So what we did was also to check what other communities were, uh, were doing. And one of the implementations that uh, was really helpful to us as a guide was the test check implementation that comes from Clojure. Okay? And the, the focus of the implementation of property-based testing is the generators, right? The focus are the data generators. So let's talk about them. So what are generators? Okay, so generators, as we saw, right, so we have a module that's going to be called stream.data that we're going to import it and it's going to add a bunch of generators for different data types that we have in Elixir. And here we are seeing the integer generator, okay? So we have the integer generator say, hey, give me 10 values. And we can see that it generates uh, random values, right? And they're also not unique. They're not unique. So we can see duplicated values in there as well. But you can also say, hey, generate me a bunch of ASCII strings. Right? So, and which properties do generators have? Generators are lazy, okay? So when you call just the integer uh, generator, it's just going to return a lazy data structure. We don't get values from it at that moment. Just say, hey, this is something that knows how to generate integers. And then that's only way to say, hey, give me 10 or give me 20, that is going to spit those values out. But you need to be careful because they are infinite. 
So if you say, hey, I want to get this integer generator and convert it to a list, so we want to make the generator uh, concrete, okay, all of the values concrete, that's never going to finish, right? Because it's going to keep on generating values forever. As we said, they are random. Okay, so every time I call the generator, the same generator, it's going to return different values. Uh, and they are not unique. And another interesting property from generators is that they grow in size. So we can see here that they are all, at the beginning, they are always emitting small numbers. Okay, but if we say, hey, I want to drop the first 100 elements and give me the rest, right? When we do that, we can see that it's generating larger numbers now, because as they generate values, okay, th those values, they, they have pure amplitude for integers, for example. And that's how we write the property-based test. We are just leveraging generators. I say, hey, I want to generate all the, this bunch of strings, and I'm going to use that in my string functions. Okay? So property-based test is really built on top of the generators and, uh, and leverage everything the generators have to offer. If you go check the string data library in Elixir, which is uh, we, right now is not merged into Elixir itself, it's a separate library, you're going to see that the core of the work is all in the data generation, the property-based testing wrapper around it, it's super small, okay? So we would write those tests like this, right? We would write those properties. And, but there is one last property that we want from our generators, one last feature that we want from our generators that is very, very important, which is the last one I'm going to talk about. It's also that generators are shrinkable, okay? So imagine that you are there, you're writing your test now using properties, you're very excited about it, and you're getting better code, uh, better test code uh, as well with it. And, uh, imagine, and imagine that we have this test, and this is a test that is going, we wrote it to fail on purpose, okay? But imagine we have this test, just as an example. So we want to check that element is not a list. So we say, well, I want to generate a list of integers, and I want to assert that the number 22 is not in the list. What is going to happen here is that this test is eventually going to fail, because eventually we are going to generate the integer 22 that is going to be in the list, and that's going to make the test fail, okay? But when this test fail, it can be when, you know, when the list has 30 elements, 25, 40 elements, we don't know, right? So what would happen is that um, we would be testing this code, right? And then it's going to say, look, when I generate this input, this list with 30 elements, this code fails, right? And then you need to look at that input and say, oh, why is this code fa failing when I have this list? What is the characteristic that is here in this list that make this code fail? For this simple code, it's really easy to find that out, right? It's when you have the number 22 in it. But when you're testing your own code, that may not be that obvious. So the idea that generators are, sh uh, we can shrink generators is that when there is a failure, we are going to try to generate smaller list possible in this case that can make that test fail because we already have the condition, the failing condition. So we try to find the minimum input which is something that we do a lot in practice, right? If you're maintaining a project, someone reports a bug, what do we ask? Hey, do you have a minimal test case that reproduces the bug, right? Um, the generators are doing that automatically for us. So generators are shrinkable. So here's an example of a error report that we would get, right? It would say, uh, well, I tried, I generated 29 values, right? And on my 29th try, I got an error. And here's the error and the shrunk generated value is the list with 22, with 22 in it, okay? And how they are implemented? The generators in Elixir, they are very simple. So they are um, functions, okay, that receives two arguments. Uh, the first one is the seed that we use for random generation, and the second one is the size, because we want them to grow in size, right, as we're generating more values. And it returns a tuple with two elements. The first element is the element being generated right now, and the second element is the function that knows how to shrink that value if eventually we want to shrink that. Okay. So that's it. So string data provides data generation primitives uh, to Elixir. It brings stateless property-based testing to XUnit, right? But what we are doing here, so our goal here is to get people into property-based testing because this, the discipline go way beyond what I just showed here, right? So what we have in Elixir is just stateless property-based testing. But there's a bunch of other stuff, ways of testing, sim uh, testing systems um, that we can explore, with, for example, with more robust tools like QuickCheck, right? QuickCheck provides more advanced ch features such as model checking, stateful checking. Uh, it allows to, they have something called Pulse, 
which coordinate how the processes are scheduled in the VM and so on. So if you're interested in more advanced testing tools, even I re recommend you to go uh, to the Quebec uh, website. John Hughes and his team, they are working on those tools directly and improving them. And it's not only for Elixir, it's for Erlang, C, C++, and so on, right? Well, so that's it. That's the end of the talk of Hughes-driven development. As I said in the beginning, it's a play with words uh, with test-driven in the sense that people say, well, you should write the test first. And the joke here is that we wait for John Hughes to come up with an idea and then 10 years later, we add it to our programming languages and everybody's happy. But uh, taking the joke aspect out of it, I think it's a very interesting uh, way of showing how you know, industry and academia, and uh, they are working together. So sometimes you have uh, an idea introduced, and then the academia itself refine those ideas, often implementing that into different programming languages. Those ideas are contributed back, and then somebody takes them, improves it a little bit, or somebody takes it to a whole different uh, set of programming languages, improves them more. Uh, and it's a very nice way to see how those things come together at the end. And, um, especially with property-based testing, for example, that we see now in all different kinds of languages and different maintainers um, writing and maintaining those. All right, and finally, I want just to last note. So first, I want to thank Platform Attack, which is my company, the company behind Elixir. Uh, a lot of the work that we see in Elixir is being driven by Platform Attack and also to the Elixir team. Uh, so uh, in particular, the code and the Elixir community as well. So Louis is here, he's, I think he's the first one to write a code formatter for Elixir, and he helped us, us get this final version uh, on. Um, and Andrea, we, he's on the Elixir, Elixir team as well. He's the one working on string data mainly. So I want to thank everybody, and uh, especially thank John Hughes. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Do we have time for questions, or should I take them out? Um, we have plenty of time for questions, so right. if the audience uh, shouts those out, we also have microphones, but it might be a little difficult to sort of rush across the room um, and, and get those to you. But we have plenty of time for questions, so if you raise your hand, and is it okay if you choose? Sorry? Is it okay if you choose um, from the audience? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. For free? Thank you. Wait, wait, hold on. I think there is some other. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not uh, really familiar with uh, Elixir or its libraries, but uh, uh, you mentioned uh, test check, and uh, I'm familiar with uh, closure infrastructure a little bit. And uh, what uh, m makes it strong in closure that uh, you can check out the data that you're using, and uh, it kind of can generate all the uh, s streams that you test with uh, itself. Is there anything similar to that in Elixir or any plans for that? So just so you mentioned closure spec or yes. yes. Yeah, so we don't have something similar to closure spec right now. Uh, but um, closure spec was one of the was one of the things that also helped push over us to to have uh, property based tests in Elixir because they showed that with a single construct you can generate, you can leverage a lot of features out of it, right? So out of the spec, you get data validation, you get data generation, you get documentation. Uh, so, so, yeah, I'm familiar with it. We don't have that in Elixir right now, but I think it would be super nice if someone interested to start exploring that and integrating with the tools that we have today. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Hi, you presented a stream generator. Is it possible to nest generator? To nest generators, let's say, yes, like in quick check, I'll do one off and things like this. Yeah, so uh, the question is it possible to nest generators? Yeah, so the one off bind all of those constructions that are common to data generation and property based testing, they are in Elixir as well. Okay, great. Thank I you. So. Uh, someone asked a question down here as well? Um, yeah. Somebody's coming.
You can ask, I'll repeat, that's fine. If you use property-based testing, um, how long do you check how much data you generate? Oh, excellent question. Uh, if you use property-based testing, uh, how, how, for how long do you test? Um, the default is 100 tries. Uh, but there are ways for you to customize it. You can say, well, I want to test for five seconds. I want to test 1,000 tries, and so on. Yeah? So, are there any resources that you can recommend for transitioning from the example-based test to property-based testing that can help me identify the properties of my own code? Oh, so uh, anything that I recommend to transition from example-based testing to property-based testing? So um, you don't transition, actually, because the example-based testing, they are two very, very useful. And uh, so, for example, one of the things I like to do is that when a property goes wrong, I write an example-based testing, an example-based test out of that error, for example. So you actually want both to, to coexist. Um, I believe there is, I'm not going to remember the name of the book, but there is a very good book right now by uh, Fred Ebert, um, which is propcheck.com or something like that, which is a very excellent book uh, for Erlang. It's using different tools, but the concepts there are the same. And uh, it's recently out and it's really great as his previous work. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's really nice. Like, I find it very useful too. Uh, but um, especially sometimes to test the corner cases, right? So my question would be: some corner cases seems to be more like more interesting than others. Say, I don't know, an empty list or an empty string, or I don't know. Like, so how how do the generators make sure that they generate more of these kind of like cor common corner cases uh, rather than just random data? I, I assume it's not like just completely random, right? Because yeah. So the question is, how do generators, they, there are things that are prone to errors, right? So, uh, so how does the generator handle that? So um, it depends. It's going to depend on the property-based testing library and it's going to depend on the generator as well. So for example, for an integer, you want to test things like 0, minus 1, and 1. And because it grows in size, the chance that you're going to get one of those eventually it's very, very high, right? Especially over multiple runs. So for that integer generator, we may say, well, I, I'll let it be. I know that eventually it's going to be covered. But there are other generators like, imagine it could even be the integer or imagine that you have a big integer generator where you want to test the boundary when the thing doesn't fit in memory anymore and it goes to another representation. Or the same thing with float numbers, you want to test a different boundaries in there. So for those cases, because the size would not allow you to get there, the library may say, I'm always including those when I run the tests. I don't remember in particular uh, in Elixir which approach we're taking for each generator, but those are the, what, some of the ways of tackling this problem. Ah. Okay, there is a question here as well. Is it easy to write your own generator? Um, is it easy to write your own generator? Is yes and no. So uh, if you're writing your generator from scratch, which is what we did in the library, it's a little bit, there are some concerns you need to take and so on. It's not super straightforward, but for us that are going to be consuming the library, we are always building on top of the, the existing generators. It's very unlikely that you, are, you need to write something from scratch. Because in Elixir, the amount of data types that we have, they are fixed. So as long as we know, so everything that you need to generate is going to be something that you, cons you build on top of an existing data type. So we are going to get the data type for that generator, and then you're going to map over it, for example, and get something different. So we are not, so building is not super straightforward, but you wouldn't be building, you would always be composing. That's kind of the short answer.
Do you think that with property testing, there's a point at which a given test has exhausted its value? Like, do you think that uh, keeping these tests around for a long time continues to have value, or is most of the value in property testing uh, upfront when you're initially trying to look for edge cases and corner cases? That's a very good question. Uh, I've heard from, so, because they take some time, some time to, to run, I heard people that they keep that separately in the suite, and they run, for example, only on CI, and they don't have run it on the machine. So they get, they still get the, the, the assertion of the properties, but not every time they run the suite. And probably the reason why they are doing that is exactly because they did the trade-off and they say, well, I don't want to put development time every time I'm here, but there's still something to leverage from the property, even if it, we are talking about in terms of regressions, right? So I would say that, so maybe one way to look at it is that if at some point being property-based as they're not useful anymore, they're still going to be as useful as an example-based testing in, when it comes to, it's going to help you not have regressions. But I think this balance, it's, uh, it's probably going to change from, from team to team and, and on, on your experience. Because, because the other thing is that the properties, they are also very good for documentation, right? And we need to remember that. So if we erase them completely from the code base, right, that, that property that says how the code should behave, which you can be used to explain that code to other developers, it's going to be lost as well. So the trade-off of moving it to the side may be useful for, for some. I know that some, they actually don't mind, right? If you have a library that is the task they're running in two seconds and they're going to move that to one second because we remove property-based tasks, like why bother? So, uh, yeah, I think it's a very good question. The answer is going to probably ch is going to change depending on the project and on the team you ask. Yeah, we have more questions here. It's a good exercise. All right. Hey, um, so you just mentioned um, uh, documentation and that the, the property tests are good documentation, which I very much agree with, but um, are there any ideas of actually connecting documentation and property-based tests so that they actually will be the documentation? Yeah, that's a very good question. Should we actually, since I just said that the property is good for documentation, maybe Alexir should have a way where we can get the property and show in the documentation page. Yeah, I think that's the idea uh, really worth exploring, yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much for the questions, for attention. I will also be out, so if somebody still want to talk about and discuss things, I'll be glad to hear about it. Thank you very much.